so much um, to um, both of our wonderful organisers for organising <laughs> such a varied and stimulating, not to mention important and much needed, I think, event. Um, I've already learnt an incredible amount um, and we're incredibly grateful for this opportunity to share um, with such a broad range of colleagues and interested parties our very, very new research project, which I'm pleased to say was recently awarded um, British Academy funding. The project is in fact so new um, that the official start date isn't for another couple of weeks. Um, and that being the case, we are very, very, even more than usually open to your feedback and suggestions as we take it forward. Um, we're also very conscious of uh, Zoom conference fatigue, um, so we will do our best to keep this snappy. Um, the project then um, grew out very organically um, of developing research within the Centre for Childhood Cultures at Queen Mary University of London, um, cross-fertilised with the urgent and ongoing discussions that have been happening within the centres now, obviously online, postgraduate and postdoctoral discussion group. Our centre has always worked um, with a range of external partners from the Museum of Childhood to the London Symphony Orchestra and we've de deliberately sought out contributions from speakers from a really broad range of disciplinary and extra academic backgrounds. So this new project, which is a collaboration with children's magazine Storytime, is very much at home within this centre. The project itself, um, just to give you a very um, broad overview, and then um, my colleagues Rachel and Lucy are going to um, develop the two key strands. The project um, focuses on storytelling, uh, a very obviously key theme to our conference, past and present, and aims to mitigate the immediate and longer term educational, social and mental health aspects of COVID-19, which we've already been looking at. Um, as well as, um, crucially, the marginalisation of children's voices. Um, as I said, there are two interlinked strands to the project. The first um, explores historical children's interaction with classical role models in early children's magazines, which forged new communities through distance learning. And the second uh, focuses on creative responses to heroic narratives today in light of COVID-19. Researching the archival and the contemporary material together enables us to, we hope, understand shifting but enduring notions of both heroism and childhood. And um, a series of outputs are planned for this project. Um, the in collaboration with uh, Storytime magazine and underpinned by the historical research, we're going to be producing a series of print and digital resources, um, enabling children to make reassuring trans-temporal connections with models of survival. These will also be used as prompts to encourage children's own creative responses as a way of facilitating emotional processing. At the same time, via a series of blog posts, we're going to be um, attempting to document some of the many contemporary narr narratives and resources which address COVID-19, um, some of which we've been hearing about so um, brilliantly this morning, um, and with a particular focus on narratives of heroism. So together with the archive of creative responses to the story time resources, we're hoping to produce a substantial body of work for future research. So it's a project that's prompted by the pressing needs of children today, um, but also one very much grounded in the past uh, and looking to the future. So I'm going to hand over now um, to my colleague, Rachel Bryant Davies, who's going to outline the first of these two strands for us. Thank you, Kira, and thank you, Lee and Ruby, for gathering everyone today to share the incredible projects we've been hearing about already. As Kira said, this project is still very much in the early stages, um, so this is an informal preview because we don't take up the grant until August. Can I just check, um, is my screen sharing working? Yeah, excellent, thank you. So a key part of the project is the collaboration, and we're thrilled to be working with Storytime magazine, which is a social enterprise aimed at promoting literacy, um, among readers aged three to nine and changing lives. 
And here's a little bit in brief um, about Storytime magazine um, that you can see. So we're going to be creating and distributing resources throughout the UK and um, worldwide through online resources to help children navigate the impacts of COVID-19. Um, we're going to be using the existing custom base and relationships, including with schools and councils. And the primary motivation of this aspect is to help make a practical difference to children's, teachers, parents and carers' lives in such challenging times and hopefully provide resources that are both supporting literacy and providing an opportunity to process experiences of COVID-19. So the focus on classical myth, history and legend intends, as the speaker raised earlier, to provide some escapism and some distance to process these difficult experiences while also providing some sense of historical resilience and linking to the national curriculum. Having said that, the collaboration was originally inspired, sorry, my dog has something to say, um, originally inspired by historical research. And um, so this morning, Pauline, um, I thought I would briefly share the genesis of this collaboration and the sorts of approaches that we're thinking through. So it grew originally out of a planned non-COVID themed collaboration, um, which was uh, very lucky that we were already in conversation about how we could um, partner together. And uh, that meant that we were in a position to quite quickly adapt to think through what we could do to respond um, to the challenges right now. Um, and it's also uh, to do with my research into interaction with classics and historical magazines and wider research into 19th century British children's encounters with Greco-Roman classical antiquity. Um, just, um, sorry, that was who reads uh, the readership base of Storytime magazine. Um, and you can see that they're targeting both at home contexts and also school and library contexts. So the historical magazine, this is just for context, um, so that you can get an idea of where I'm coming from. Um, I've been analysing a range of playful and pedagogical genres to discover how specific ideologies were camouflaged by classical coatings. So the power of a story to channel um, positive messages as well as um, potentially harmful or negative ones in the past. Um, so focusing on different strategies for literacy and morals and citizenship education and varied and conflicting role models and also contrasting ideas of ex exemplarity and subversion. And classics is a challenging case study uh, because it permeated so much of 18th to early 20th century culture in so many ways as a staple of both educational and popular culture. Um, and it's also a difficult example because classical knowledge was and often still is so often taken as a marker of elite status and imperial oppression. And it's certainly the case, but there's also evidence for classical knowledge as a means of subversion and social mobility. So why magazines? Um, in my research um, because they can provide models and strategies which are adjustable to the social and educational challenges posed by COVID-19. So um, you've got the formation of virtual communities and remote learning and playful pedagogy um, and interaction and in the image there um, that's actually some rules for submissions and um, prize participation. Um, so evidence of, of children uh, repeatedly contributing and participating in things through the same title. So for us now, overturning stereotypes regarding unheard children, um, they captured children's responses, overcame isolation and served as proxies for direct experiences promoting social mobility. So I don't want to spend too long on the historical aspects, um, but I've just included a few examples of magazine pages so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, and uh, I'm using the example of Pericles um, because he's been taken as a historical parallel within COVID-19, mostly for adults, um, although I don't know whether this link is going to work. Um, I don't know whether you've seen the video of the ancient Athenian girl. No, that's not going to work. Um, but the link is there for when these get sent round. Um, the United Nations sent round an 11-year-old Athenian girl um, reanimated from remains that were found in excavations in Athens. Um, she was a victim of the Great Plague of Athens in the time of Pericles, and she's used um, animated as a messenger um, to uh, send a message of solidarity um, to world citizens. They call on every citizen of the world to fight the virus in her voice. So Pericles, the Athenian leader, 
Um, biographies of him in the 19th century were very common, and they included discussion of the plague of Athens, um, which was often used to think through contemporary epidemics, such as cholera and typhoid, as well as city planning issues. So here are some um, journalism page layouts um, with some varied examples. Um, there's some stories, both fictional um, and also more reference, some illustrations. Um, and there's also on this page, um, another story with a different page layout, um, a puzzle, Pericles' name there is right at the bottom of the middle image, um, and a page of letters to the editor um, where Pericles is mentioned. And these aren't the most exciting examples I've ever found of magazines. I was just teasing a range of, of representative samples that focused on Pericles. I also want to emphasize that there's no suggestion that we're going to be using uh, 19th century content for contemporary children and any inspiration in terms of the choice of the myths or the interactivity is going to be carefully scrutinised. So the benefits are in taking positive lessons from the origins of the magazine genre with the historical hindsight that gives clarity in analysing how such media conveyed messages to children and harnessing that for positive messages today. I also want to emphasise that we've budgeted to consult a childhood psychologist um, for support in making sure that we support uh, mental health needs. Um, and of course, the key to these myths, especially for the younger range of readers, um, so starting around age three, is to tell the right bit of the story and to stop at the right place. So returning to the contemporary collaboration with Storytime, the following slides give you some indication of the amazing range of their content and their readership, as well as the educational resources that support the stories. Um, and you can see here they've given a sense of, of uh, the areas that are covered. I'm particularly interested in the prospect of preparing some interactive games, um, which give children the opportunity to take charge of and change the narratives. Um, so here you've got some of the, the teaching uh, activities, resources. Um, this is just statistics to show you that the digital resources, as well as the print subscriptions, do reach um, around the world. Our print resources will probably focus largely um, on some councils and schools um, in the UK. And here's a range of um, the colourful, uh, beautiful artwork, um, just to give you a taste of that. Um, and some of the resources in terms of reading buddy suggestions. Um, so they suggest pairing older and younger children um, together so that the children can can lead their own reading and, and take some ownership of the stories. Uh, these are some interactive games, um, just some photographs I take of copies that I have, so apologies for the, the, the bendiness of the pictures. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in the prospect of, of preparing some games along these lines, um, because children then can take the agency in playing the stories. Um, they also intersect with the historical games and toy theatres that I've researched. Um, that looks something like this, a panorama in the top right hand corner that was used for teaching geography and history um, and some history of the world type games and interactive cards there. So we're in the early stages of course of planning the delivery of the resources. Um, here are some suggestions for the themes and ideas for applicable stories um, and I'm going to show you some images in a moment of how existing stories from the back catalogue of the magazine um, can be repurposed um, with some conversation prompts and so on. We're not after a perfect mapping on of this is a myth and it tells you how you should feel about now. Um, we're after a much more organic um, learning about uh, past role models, um, stories with both um, challenging role models as well as easy role models. Um, we're not going to shy away uh, from uh, potentially not everything is going to have a happy ending, that's not how these myths work, um, although they obviously will be sensitively adapted. Um, so we're thinking through concepts of heroism is, is going to be underlining the whole series, the experiences of lockdown with isolation and confinement, um, so for example the town mouse and the country mouse story um, is a very good way to think through different experiences, um, there's also the possibility of using other myths such as Prometheus, who's isolated on the mountainside, or Achilles, who's sulking in his tent while his army's suffering. Um, like I said, these aren't things that map on perfectly, but they do provide conversation prompts. 
uh, armor, equipment, um, personal protective equipment. Um, in the story of Pegasus, there's a bridle for the horse, which is a special weapon. Um, I'm very keen to, uh, to use the magazine's focus on female pr protagonists um, wherever possible. I just didn't have the pictures uh, here to take photos of. Um, so there are stories on Atalanta and the Golden Apples, um, Demeter and Persephone, where the pomegranate seeds mean that she's half in the underworld and half in the upper world. Um, and the Amazon Penthesilea is a potential new story. Uh, Perseus and Madeira is perhaps a more obvious choice. Um, and there's scope for a lot of interactive, um, imagine what your armour would look like, uh, sort of activities. Um, other topics would be um, epidemics and hygiene um, or infection control. So Midas and the Golden Touch, which in the 19th century I found a story where it was described as an epidemic of gold. Um, everything he touches turns to gold, which is great until he tries to eat and then he starves. Um, this particular story has a happy ending, the, um, the ability to turn things into gold is taken back. But I think that's an interesting way to think through um, the important example of hand sanitizer for a very young child. Um, other stories that we could think through, um, grief and trauma. Um, so these are some stories which include those topics in a very um, accessible way with uh, different characters. So the bit I've enlarged on the left, Romulus and Remus, um, there's a story of sibling rivalry that ends in murder. Um, and Helios and Clyte is a relationship breakup. So thinking through familial separations and anxiety. Um, we'd also like to do stories on overcoming challenges and adversity, um, innovations, um, so great inventions, uh, stories of escape, so, for example, um, there's a, a girl from Rome who leads a group of girls to escape a camp when they're being taken hostage. Um, there's the story of Perseus escaping as a baby with his mother, where um, the grandfather's keeping the prisoner. And there's also stories of education and healthcare. So this is a 19th century story about Chiron's school for heroes. Um, so centaurs uh, and heroes learning together that involves some medical education. Uh, in the wider myths as well. So that's just a, a brief uh, summary of, of where we're coming from with some of the ideas and um, some of the potential that there is for this project. And uh, we're open to ideas, especially in light of interactive potential. Um, and the details are still being arranged, of course. Um, we need to abide by GDPR regulations in any contact with the readers, um, which is why we're not in a position to share exact uh, details at the moment. So to summarise, the collaboration uh, with Storytime magazine enables speediness and flexibility in the resources and we hope that print distribution will reach those who are unable to access online resources. And the aim is to use ancient myth informed by historical research to learn from and improve upon past responses to disasters and disease, as well as the educational and social mobility embedded in the origins of children's magazine publishing. We're also hoping to contribute to archive formation for future public history research, um, perhaps through creative responses, um, enlarging on established means of, of gaining feedback as well. So thank you very much for your attention this morning. Please do get in touch if you'd like to talk further. Um, we're aiming to run some parent and teacher workshops, um, which will be publicised in due course, um, or with a view to further collaborations. And I'm now going to hand over to Lucy Glasheen, who's just going to talk about another aspect of our project, documenting children's resources and responses for future research. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you, Kira. Um, yeah, so the second strand of the project, um, as has been mentioned, is the documentation of new children's books and resources produced in response to the COVID-19 pandemic and in response to the resulting public health measures. Um, and as we've already kind of started to get a sense of this morning, a panoply of largely free books for children have been created with the aim of informing children about the virus um, and educating them about public health measures such as washing hands, but also with the aim of helping children to emotionally navigate the new situation and changes to their everyday lives. The New York City Library System have created a catalogue of globally produced free COVID-19 ebooks for children, which currently has over 260 entries. And this includes work 
by established children's authors, illustrators and publishers, created by charities and other organisations, um, and self-published work produced by first-time authors. Um, as we've heard, the support of publishers and bodies such as the World Health Organization on the one hand, and the ease of self-publication and free publication that the internet affords on the other, has allowed authors and illustrators to rapidly respond, produce books and make them available. However, the specificity of the content, the speed of production, and the fact that they're often only available online, makes these ephemeral texts and I think there is a real risk that they're quickly forgotten about um, and that they don't receive the careful attention that they deserve. And obviously, I'm probably preaching to the converted here, um, but I think it's really important that we start to look critically at this corpus and that it is documented and archived for future, resource, future researchers. Um, and it's not actually in the scope or capability of our project to archive these texts, but I would be really interested to know whether there are any plans or projects to do so. Um, the New York City school library system that I mentioned is doing excellent work in promoting and making these texts available. But as far as I know, it's only saving the links rather than the texts themselves. So in the me short and medium term, looking at these texts now means we can start to spot strengths, weaknesses and gaps in provision for children, which can then be addressed both within our project and by others. In the medium and longer term, the texts give us vital insight into contemporary understandings of disease and contemporary ideas about children and their role or place in society. And this is particularly the case due to the speed in production, which may mean popular tropes are common as they are more easily reached for. Um, and also their diversity allows us to potentially explore how these ideas are shared or differ. So the idea, um, as has been mentioned, is that our project will use blog posts to document a selection of contemporary texts for children about COVID-19. We are restricted by our resources in terms of time and, and website functionality, so we're not aiming for comprehensive coverage. The blog format allows us to get material out rapidly and throughout the next 18 months um, to be available to academics practitioners, authors and other interested parties to help future researchers to start to navigate this corpus and to provide the beginnings of more sustained research. And it can also potentially inform the resources which will be produced with Storytime. So we're in the very early stages of collecting and reviewing this corpus and of deciding how to narrow our scope and focus in the collecting and documenting stages. So I'd really appreciate your thoughts on this. And so I wanted to explore some very early, uh, very initial ideas with you um, about the construction of heroism, community, and the roles of children in COVID-19 children's books. And I'll be focusing on two books, Even Superheroes Stay at Home by uh, Jamie McGaw, which you can hopefully see on your screens now, um, and Nut and Kitchy by Sandra Samate and Julian Graffenauer. So Even Superheroes Stay Home is a rhyming picture book um, that can be downloaded as a PDF from McGaw's website. McGaw describes himself as a creative writer, sorry, a creative director, writer and filmmaker who's based in Oregon in the US and Even Superheroes appears to be his first book. The book focuses solely on the need to stay home and the narrative help, attempts to help children come to terms with this through describing a series of activities that a child protagonist and, and reader can do in order to be uh, caring and brave and save the day. In this sense, it potentially has a shelf life beyond the pandemic. According to McGaw's website, he originally wrote the book for his son and the text is written in second person and encourages the reader to identify with the illustrated male protagonist. Even superheroes explicitly frames ordinary everyday activities as superheroic, including what might be thought of as leisure pursuit pastimes, such as playing with a sibling and reading, and what might be thought of as domestic chores, such as dog walking and washing up. 
So we can see this American book bringing together two heroic tropes with, that have been uh, become quite common in Britain in the last few months. The first is that of heroic children who are heroic simply for surviving lockdown. And this can be seen in um, the British Red Cross's recent launch of a Little Heroes resource pack, the video about which shows children playing in superhero capes and masks. The second more dominant trope um, is that of the ordinary hero. The idea of the unsung or hidden heroes who are helping us to survive the pandemic initially focused on doctors and nurses, uh, but quickly expanded to include cleaners, carers, delivery drivers, work, uh, waste collectors, and other jobs that are usually thought of as being low skilled, or usually described as being low skilled, I should say. And the ordinary hero is usually gendered or often gendered as female, um, and traits celebrated as heroic are feminized traits of caring. And this is exemplified in um, two poems from a, a Scottish um, anthology for children. Um, the poem Superhero by Rachel Plummer, who celebrates my mum, a supermarket worker who goes to work to keep you fed and then comes home to hug me tight. The hero, hunger mender, key worker and smile defender. And Daisy's mum by Yasmin, Yasmin Hanif, who goes to help those unwell, but it replies to the protagonist calling her a hero by saying, there's others with different powers, voices that heal, voices that say, you rest my wee flowers, you'll be okay. And you have to imagine that last bit in a Scottish accent. Um, so in Even Superheroes, the reader is told that playing, cleaning, and kind words and strong hugs are all heroic tasks that will save the day. And the book might therefore be seen as part of an important shift towards valuing domestic labour and feminised qualities, while seeing children as playing an important role within the household um, and recognising the unique challenges that children that uh, lockdown poses to children. However, there are some weaknesses or potential gaps in the book's evocation of children's role in child heroism. The construction of these tasks or activities as superheroic suggests that there is an extraordinary aspect to them. Perhaps because cleaning and caring come to have meaning temporarily uh, in the face of a pandemic um, and will go back to becoming invisible afterwards, or perhaps in this instance, because the involvement of children as contributing members of the household, taking responsibility for domestic tasks is unusual. The, su the superhero trope potentially does little to permanently disrupt and challenge sexist and ageist sy uh, value systems. Also aside from a uh, telephone call with grandma, there is no sense of the world beyond the nuclear family. The physical restriction within the house appears to, that the book focuses on, seems to result in restricting the impact that the protagonist and therefore the child reader can have to within the house, rather than framing the act of staying in as actually related to a wider community. Also the second person narr narration encourages total identification with the protagonist and the listing of activities while providing a narrative and rhythm to the story does restrict the possibilities open to a child reader. Um, and these weaknesses are potentially revealed particularly when even superheroes is compared to a very different book, uh, Nitta and Kitchi, written by Sandra Samate and illustrated by Julian Graffenauer, is a story and journal activity book that can be read for free on Flipsnap or downloaded as a PDF from Newfoundland and Labrador Public Library's website. The book is mainly aimed at educating and informing about COVID-19 public health measures using the framing device of a family living in Scowden First Nation in Canada working on Project Protect Our People. This is one of a number of children's books written by Samate who works at the Manitoba First Nations Education Resource Centre and lives in Scown First Nation herself. And that includes a book uh, featuring the same characters.
In contrast with even superheroes, Nitty, Nitty and Kitchy presents a number of different characters which the reader can identify with, and the framing device gives them each individual responsibility for part of the project. This suggests that rather than children being separated off from adults and given certain child appropriate things to do, each member of the family has a role to play, although those roles may be specific and restricted in certain ways. Nutta and Kitchi does not explicitly um, engage with the heroic narrative, instead using language of protection. It strongly suggests that children have a role in protecting the people around them, and the book repeatedly makes links between the immediate family and a wider community. And this includes, uh, as, oh, gone past it, as you see here, um, an inter intergenerational idea of community linking together the knowledge of elders and future generations. And the resources which are attached to the flip snap version of this book also mean that the reader can make their own choices and come up with their own ideas about how to help those around them and manage their own mental and spiritual well-being. Um, having said that, Nitin Kitchi has made, made uh, has, sorry, has much less of a narrative. Um, and this may mean that there are gaps in its ability to engage with children's emotional response to the pandemic. And we should also be wary of kind of romanticizing the idea of community. So these are, as I've said, some very kind of preliminary ideas about what these texts and what kind of a critical um, uh, approach to these texts can tell us and what might be the future of focus on of focus of future inquiry but we'd really appreciate your thoughts including about whether the blog should be global in its coverage um, and about the focus of this part of the project so i will stop share screen sharing um, thanks very much okay so um thank you everybody thank you lucy and rachel and um thank you very much everybody for listening um we're really keen to get your comments and obviously um very uh, interested in hearing your questions um especially pre-project and again thanks very much for giving us this opportunity